you for being here. I think the most important work I will ever do as a minister is the work contained in the Children's Action Plan. We are fundamentally changing the way we work with children and how we protect the most vulnerable. I feel a deep sense of responsibility for the thousands of children who are hurt and abused in this country. More than 50 children have died in the last five years because of extreme abuse. Because of abuse, a child under two is hospitalised every five days. Every year, child, youth and family substantiates 22,000 cases of physical, sexual abuse and emotional abuse and neglect. We've already introduced significant changes that are making a difference and there's an enormous amount of work underway for the Children's Action Plan. We have a National Children's Director in place, two children's teams, Rotorua is up and running and Fulleray will be soon. A vulnerable children's board of chief executives has been operating for months. And we're working on a care strategy for children in state care, a child protect line, vulnerable kids information system and increasing the pool of even caregivers. But there is much more to do. The Children's Action Plan is a 10-year plan to take those next big steps forward. Today I'm announcing the proposed legislation that gives power to that plan. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for his support for this work and also the 100% commitment that's come from many ministers who have had to be hands-on in actually helping me write and produce the work that's gone into today. We genuinely, genuinely share a responsibility for these children and together we're taking action. This is the most uh, significant legislative reform in this area since 1989 when the Children, Young Persons and Their Families Act was introduced. I've been leading a series of interrelated changes relating to vulnerable children, welfare reform and community services. These fit together with children at their core. This legislation contains major and far-reaching changes and also strengthens our commitment to children whose lives have already been damaged. It will like allow government to do everything possible to shore up frontline protections. So, the chief executives of five government agencies will be accountable for vulnerable children. There will be clear performance expectations on CEs. They'll have to report annually and answer to ministers directly on their part in a cross-agency plan for these kids. Do not underestimate the power of this unprecedented move. Never before in this country have the chief executives of health, education, police and justice had specific accountability together for vulnerable children. Now they will, alongside the Ministry of Social Development, of course. It will significantly change the way they work. They'll have to ensure they're improving the well-being of vulnerable children, protecting them from abuse and taking a child-centred approach. Together, they'll design a cross-agency plan for vulnerable children, which they'll have to report on annually and front up to ministers on the progress that they make. These five agencies, as well as TPK and the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, are all represented on the Vulnerable Children's Board. The Vulnerable Children's Board is an important part of the accountability chain, leading from the children's teams that are on the ground, um, working up to the Ministerial Oversight Group. But I see a whole children's workforce as having some level of responsibility. That is, every person who comes into contact with or works closely with our children. I'll explain the new vetting and screening um, of that workforce in a moment, but first, new restrictions will keep dangerous, violent and abusive people away from children. These are workforce restrictions that, uh, that apply to those who have serious convictions and work alongside of the screening and vetting. I'm talking about murder, manslaughter, manslaughter, sexual violation, assault on a child. It's critically important that we get this list right, so I'm asking Select Committee to explore this and for the public to have their say. 
but we simply have to protect our vulnerable children from these serious offenders. There will be serious consequences, and I'm proposing heavy fines, if organisations fail to comply with these restrictions. On top of this measure, we're introducing minimum standards for screening and vetting of the children's workforce. It will be mandatory for government or employees and agencies that contract with government and work with children and voluntary for wider community groups. There are hundreds of thousands of people in that core children's workforce. In that workforce, we're talking about paediatricians, teachers, child, youth and family social workers and children's counsellors, for example. The wider workforce could include uh, non-teaching staff, library reading group leaders and work and income case managers. All up, it's more than 370,000 people. Minimum standards for screening and vetting will identify potential abusers. It'll include specific interview techniques, thorough reference and police record checks, as well as the history and behaviour of every one of those individuals. It'll mean checking with former employers and wider community members about any concerns relating to children. Often, people have concerns and information about potential abusers, if only someone had asked. If this requirement had existed, I believe the, the employers of James Parker would have discovered people had serious <coughs> con uh, concerns about the former teacher who, as we know, abused children. Agencies will be required to do a thorough risk assessment with periodic reassessments every three years. As I said, this will be mandatory for all government agencies and government funded organisations working with children, but voluntary for other organisations. You should know that Cabinet thought long and hard about this one and had many debates. The question was where to draw the line between mandatory and voluntary pickup. We felt government had a responsibility to lead the way and make it easy for community groups to follow. I actually think they'll voluntarily take up the screening and vetting measures. We're open to the idea of having a centralised vetting and screening system, similar to the blue card system in Queensland, which we are watching closely. The community needs to be assured that we as government have done everything possible to ensure that the children's workforce is safe. Now I want to explain the child harm prevention orders. There are cases where children have been abused because a dangerous individual got close enough to do so, sometimes literally by moving into their home. I will not tolerate abusive adults having their freedom and their power over children. New Zealanders are sick of, non, of known abusers hurting more children, and so am I. Simply, children must come first. A High Court or District Court will be able to place these new civil orders on adults with a history of serious convictions who pose a high risk of abusing children. This could also include cases where, on the balance of probabilities, it's believed the person was responsible for seriously abusing or killing a child. Harassment orders are decided on this basis, so it is not legally unusual. They could be placed on top of restraining and harassment orders. These orders can restrict people from living with children, going to places where children often are, like parks, and working or associating with children. An order can also restrict that person from changing their name. There will be changes to protect children born to parents who've previously abused or killed a child. Currently, it's only when those abusive parents have a subsequent child and come to the attention of child, youth and family that that child's safety is assessed. If child, youth and family believe the child is unsafe, it has to prove that to the court. We will reverse that burden of proof. The parent will have to prove that their, children, their child is safe in their care. We're talking about cases where children have previously been killed or have survived the worst examples of abuse. We know that past behaviour is a predictor of future behaviour. It is the unfortunate reality that some children are at risk from the day they're born. 
I'm de demanding a higher level of scrutiny. All cases under this criteria will be assessed. Through a clear process, Child, Youth and Family will provide an assessment to the Family Court, which then makes the ultimate decision. Parents, of course, will have a part in that process and can always appeal decisions. This legislation makes it possible to curtail the guardianship rights of parents whose children are taken into care and placed into a home for life. We introduced Home for Life in 2010. If a child can't be with their parents, we aim to find them a permanent home for life. We know permanency is vital and a Home for Life family can provide the love and stability that child desperately needs. It is a step below adoption so birth parents retain a number of rights to maintain a connection to the child. And this is as it should be. We should always endeavour to foster those family ties. Unfortunately, some birth parents exploit those rights and create instability and emotional turmoil for the caregiving families and the children. This happens when parents veto overseas holidays so a week-long trip to holiday to Australia, which may be the first holiday that a child has had, can be sabotaged. It happens when vexatious attempts to drag out court cases, some of which can be played out over many years, leaving the child in a constant state of unease over their future. It also happens with weekend visits from particularly aggressive or manipulative parents who seek to undermine the new family home. There are examples of how birth parents can pull the rug out from under those children who desperately need stability. Right now, we have only ever had very light or very heavy-handed options to address this. Under this new legislation, family court judges will have a new tool. It means that the judge can, can set a specific guardianship right that is proportionate to that individual child and their new family. These ch changes might be controversial. That's an unfortunate reality, but they are necessary. These changes are significant and will make a fundamental difference to protecting the most vulnerable children and allowing them to thrive. I want to reiterate what I'm announcing today is the legislative elements of the Children's Action Plan. This is a part of a large moving body of work that's already underway. I called you here today because it's complex and it's detailed, and it's very important. So it's important to me that you and the four New Zealanders understand it fully. This legislation is planned to be introduced this month and there will, of course, be a full select committee process. We will be inviting everyone who submitted on the green paper two years ago to get involved and have a say in this legislation. As always, we're listening and open, change, open to changes to this bill, but we're equally determined to take action and make a real difference. On um, prevention orders, could you perhaps reiterate how extreme those restrictions could be um, and what happens if the judges get it wrong? Yeah, well, they're going to have to develop an assessment tool, and we haven't done that yet. So that will be a group of export firms who assure me that they can. So that assessment will take into consideration past behaviour, advice from um, police, Ministry of Social Development in cases, and they can also be applied from um, the Chief Executive Corrections at the end of the sentence. So that assessment tool will be what's most important in deciding what those restrictions are, and they'll be relevant to the individual. But it could mean they can't live with any child, so not just necessarily their own, but any. Um, it could mean that they can't live close to a school. Um, it could mean that they can't go to parks or other places where children gather. Would it have applied to the likes of Chris Cattley and Maxine King, or wasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's too hard for me to pick a case and, and look, look backwards. Um, so I suppose you can make your own judgments on that, but um, I, it would depend if the police had taken that to, to the, um, and tried to apply an order. But that's the sort of circumstance that it would that we would see the supply of. It is certainly in circumstances where we believe that, um, uh, well, we can, we can tell the children's been either um, hideously abused or killed, and it may not have gone to um, the high threshold of actually being able to convict someone, but, we, but the police believe that they are a danger. They will, have to they will have to prove that they believe they're a high risk to children. Critics are going to argue that this is tantamount to the um, butch trials, that you're not necessarily going based on the you're going based on the risk. 
and we get that wrong. Yeah, which is why I think it's important that we have a whole lot of stages in place. So you will see that in a say we a very such um, assessment tool. It can only be at the request of the Commissioner of Police, the Chief Executive of MSD, or um, the Chief Executive of Corrections at the end of the sentence. And it's before a court, and so a judge is making the decisions, and of course they can be appealed. That reverse onus that's retrospective, that's going to see children taken off some parents as soon as this comes into force that effectively. Um, it could do. So you could see some children that we ever didn't know were born and they may come to our attention. But I think more you will see that an assessment would be done at the moment. Um, child, youth and family only do an assessment if they would, if they think they need to remove the child as such. Oh, no, sorry, it only goes to court when they're going to um, remove a child. All will now go to court. They're not going to scroll back and pass cases because they would have already have done um, assessments, but it will go from there. How will you make a parent so this will be, that this, um, that will come under this and how will you know, how will you keep tabs on those parents? Yeah, well, um, most of them we do know, and that's the reality, is they are um, touching organisations all of the time. I mean, we take um, Mel Smith's inquiry into the serious abuse of a nine-year-old. We have 25 different agencies involved. Um, everyone knew them. No one had actually um, stepped up and had a plan and taken enough responsibility that we didn't see these sorts of things happening. Uh, so in most cases, as you can tell by the very stories that most of you put out there, um, they have had a history of contact with agencies. But it hasn't been as well connected and gone to child, youth and family. So there'll be much clearer directions on that. And I think just purely by having it there, people will know that they should be brought to your attention. And how will the authorities know if they have another child? Though? Well, in most cases we are told. Um, midwives tell us, um, health experts tell us, agencies that are involved with the family tell us. Uh, as I say, it's we do know most of the time. Do you expect that some children will be taken from the parents because of that change? But at the moment we take around 160 within the first month of them being born. Um, that always feels like a very high number. We think that it will be about another 150 assessments that will be done, and I obviously can't make a judgment on how many, how many of them may or may not be removed. Would there be care to cater for them at the moment, given that there is a shortage of foster homes and foster parents at the moment? Do you have safe places to put them? If yeah, children um, to be honest, we struggle with getting casements um, predominantly for older children, um, but we um, generally don't um, struggle with getting places for um, babies or, or young ones. With this screening and security vetting of the state sector employers, isn't that a case of everybody's guilty until proved innocent rather than the other way around? Or shouldn't that be targeted? I've heard this, you said something like 370,000 mm. people could be affected by that. Well, no. Aren't you tarring them all with the brush of being potential child abusers when that's in fact not the case? Most organisations already do. So if you look at um, health, paediatricians, those who are working with children, they all go through a, um, a screening and vetting. Uh, teachers do, um, so do obviously child youth and family social workers. So a lot of those organisations are already doing it. What um, we haven't got is consistency. What we do see is clear gaps between how that's done. So what we think is um, everyone's asking us for a clear standard that they can work to. Uh, I don't think we're at all tiring people with a brush of being guilty. All we're saying is, is there's actually a threshold that one must, one must um, pass to work closely in, um, with children, and I think most people would see it as reasonable. Are these judges be consistent with the Bill of Rights Act? I believe so, yes. Are you going to go back over the 376 that are already in the workforce? Um, so we're going to introduce it in the staged um, process, hopefully from about mid next year, or depending on how long it takes the bill to get through. Um, at that stage, we will just do those that are coming new into um, those professions, and then from there we will reassess as it comes up. So we'll do it in a staged manner. So we won't do 370,000 on day one, but we do propose that they should be reassessed about every three years. So uh, we, will, we will just start working our way through this. So but some won't right. need it because they already would have been. So we don't need to go. And in fact, some would have been done at a higher standard than even what, what our standard measure will propose. So, so how so many sort of people are going to be, that are part of the existing workforce, are going to be better than you? Well, the all of them over a period of time, but just not in from day one. And do you expect to find too many people, or do you expect many people to come out of that process and have to have restrictions put on them? I certainly hope not, um, but we unfortunately have examples of people working with children who 
we now know shouldn't have been. What's your message to those people who are going to fall into that category then, who are working in the workforce now? Get away from children. Do not work with children if you're unsafe to, or if you're a past history of behaviour or conviction that means that you should not be around kids. Well, speaking to the, to the mandatory report, reporting bill, and as part of those comments what we're putting instead of mandatory reporting, we're putting child protection policies in place. So those child protection policies will be expected with all government agencies and for anyone that contracts with government um, and is working with children. Uh, so they will, I think, be a much... Uh, we don't actually have a problem with reporting in this country. We have just about a higher, um, higher reporting than any other OECD country. Um, what we have an issue with is getting in and people identifying it earlier and doing something about it in a concerted manner. And that's where you're seeing those changes for chief executives having children's teams on the ground will make a biggest difference. Those well, legal obligations for chief executives, what will the repercussions be if they don't, um, if they don't comply with those legal obligations? Um, well, we certainly will be publishing um, their plan. Um, so the cross-agency plan, so it will be publicly available and the public will legally hold them to account as ministers do. But it will be part of their um, performance appraisals and part of what's expected of them. So CEs could face the same, or frontline staff could face the same if they don't? On performance, so they will be held to account as they are for all of the other obligations we expect them to undertake. I think what's so unusual is that it's um, A, being legislated and that it is um, real cross-agency work that not just looks at the safety but equally looks at the well-being of vulnerable children. So if you think about the kinds of services that these kids need, they're often very complex and they cross over you know, health and education in particular, um, but I don't want to underestimate the, um, what other agencies do as well. But if you think about the education needs of these children and the health needs, they're very complex. They don't always get to the front of the queue or even um, fairly in line with everyone else. They're often kicked to the back and this will be saying to them, um, these children are a priority for government. Would well, that negate the usual um, an excuse that we often hear in inquiries that it was a systemic or systems failure, but the chief executive is responsible for the systems, they would deem that excuse would no longer wash? Uh, that is certainly the conversations that the Vulnerable Children's Board, these chief executives, have been having. Um, what would this exactly mean? Um, where does the level of accountability and responsibility lie? Uh, and that's what I think you will be seeing in the cross-agency plan as well. But ultimately, the pressure that they're getting from ministers is that yes, we expect a different response and a better one. And basically, their head is on the block more so than it has been in the past if they don't comply with those legal obligations. Certainly, this is unprecedented. It's in legislation. It's very clear what our expectations are and um, it will be part of a performance appraisal, yeah. In terms of subsequent children, I may recall a while ago you were talking about kind of tracking those kind of parents so that when they had a child an alert popped up. Has that, has that been ditched? It's not so much um, me that was raising it. It's certainly a lot of health professionals have. I know that, um, I, uh, I know that some of our paediatricians have in the past and said we should have high alerts on them. We're still developing the Vulnerable Kids Information System, so I have um, an experts advisory group led by Surinam Suchanand that is looking at that system, who could go on it, who should go on it, what sort of privacy measures, how we protect that privacy, yet are able to share information really well. So what I've done is parked that, um, because if we were going to do any of that kind of tracking, then it would be through that system, and we're still um, at least 12 months away from developing it. How does a, um, uh, an abusive parent prove they're not going to be abusive in the future? What's the criteria there that they have to make? Yeah, well, um, the good news is I'm not writing that criteria. I expect experts to, and certainly that's what Child, Youth and Family um, assess now. Um, I mean, there's, we looked at all different um, sort of circumstances for this, and I must say there was a lot of discussion around the cabinet table about about this um, this initiative as well. Certainly, what you would you could see is someone might be young, uh, they may have been under child youth and family themselves, they might have a child young, be in an abusive relationship, and even have um, some some kind of depression or, or mental disorder. At that point, we deem that the child's not safe. The reality is that 10 years later, they may have um, got out of that relationship, re-educated themselves, be in a healthy, stable relationship. 
when that certainly, I'm sure, an assessment at that point might say that it actually, you know, um, they need a bit of support, but, but they should obviously be parenting their child and something like that. So there is clear cases, I think, where we would see that they certainly can, but too often we equally see. And, you know, there is, um, little Hale, Hale Sage McClutchy always comes to my mind, which is the little girl that died in the Waikato, and, you know, she had, she was a subsequent child, we've removed two before her. Um, and I always think of her and just think, if we'd only known, I'm not sure that she obviously would have been left in that environment because the first we kind of knew of her was when she turned up dead. Yeah. I think the Chris Guardian should watch the non birth parents say to you that this, this um, mother proves that you know, I am capable of having a kid now. Does that, in fact, that can, she get, you know, can she get back those kids that she previously had taken off her? Uh, that's not a judgment that we would make, and it's, and it's not in this work. That would always be um, social workers in the courts that would decide that. Um, but the reality is that most children that are removed, we don't remove lightly. I think it's really, really important to say that. You know, for the you know 22,000 substantiated cases of abuse and neglect in a year, we remove about 2,200, which does seem high but actually when you compare it to other jurisdictions, it's not. So we have a relatively high threshold for removing children in this country, and then more than 50% of them end up with unextended whānau. So, so actually stay within their um, familial relationships, uh, which is important to us as well. It's what the Child Youth and Family Act says, and it's certainly what we abide by. So by the time we're taking children, it's serious. And to be honest, I think it's around close to 70% don't end up going back with their parents. How much will it cost to implement these reforms? Look, most of them are being um, costed as we sort of go, but where there is some costs involved with the courts and things, um, they used to make that to be about an extra $6 million. But to be honest, we don't consider it, it high. Most of this work is the core work of police um, to be tracking these offenders. Most of the work is the core work of child, youth and family. Um, we've merely put in the legislation around it and strengthening that, so we don't see it as being a huge cost. Are there guardianship changes? So parents would basically be stripped of their guardianship rights. How common would or could that be? We've sort of looked at it and it's a bit, um, it's a bit difficult to kind of say because they will be based on a, a, you know, put on an individual basis. But uh, we have you know, we have horrific cases of um, the harassment that some parents can do. And you know, I, I, I sort of look at some of them that I see and a child's removed at birth and are in with a wonderful new family that want to love and support them. And five years later, they have been dragged through numerous court cases. Um, they've been harassed at any sort of visits they've had and been followed afterwards, I'm thinking of one particular case, um, to the point where it just, it's abusive to the child and ongoing abuse to these caregivers. So I can't give you a number on, on what I think will happen. And also I think it's important that we see it in degrees so for some it will be, yes, they still get visitation rights, but for others it will be actually if it's better for the child to move school or they need a particular medical intervention on a particular day, I think that the permanent foster carers should get to make that decision on a day-to-day -day basis at times. Is it a, is it a permanent um, thing, the removal of the guardianship rule, or is, it, is there a time frame where you go back and look at the period? It is permanent, but as with anything, it can always be appealed, <coughs> and if circumstances do change and with the agreement of both parties, or in many cases only one, it can still go back to court and be re-looked at. At the moment though, I mean I deal with them on a very regular basis, where, you know, I mean we're sort of raised attracting good people to foster these kids, and when they look at it closely they say, well, I'm going to take a child into my home, give up, you know, give everything I can to them, and then you're telling me I can't make decisions about um, a simple medical procedure or them getting their hair cut or what school they should go to. Um, and if the um, other parent is either A, completely absent, so you can't find them to help make those sorts of decisions, or they are just making them in a vexatious manner that holds the child back, then a court might decide that those day-to-day -day can be made by the parents. Now, at times it is made now, but as I indicated, it feels like it's either very light or very staunch, and I think there's some degrees in the middle. How do you stop those protection orders being used by parents in court in a relationship dispute? Because only the um, Commissioner of Police or the Chief Executive of the Ministry of Social Development or 
the chief executive of corrections can actually apply for one of these orders. Can but couldn't the off? partner make inferences that would, you know, bring alarm bells? It's a very high threshold that would have to go through the high or district court. Um, a, an assessment would be done. I, I actually don't have any concerns about that happening because of the high thresholds. So can you give a categorical assurance that, that no one has been unfairly or wrongly targeted by those credentials? It is certainly not their intention. It will be going through a full select committee process, so I'm more than happy for that to be explored at another level. But it's certainly the advice I have had is that they would not come into this at all. Can the courts and the family courts actually handle this work like they're already under a lot of pressure and the bits that are going to apply to them? Yeah, um, they, there's certainly some additional costs that they've indicated might come up for them. But, um, you know, with the changes that the Minister has made, I think that they are in a position and this is the kind of work that they want to do. At the moment, they're kind of repeatedly dealing with what we might see as fairly really insignificant issues. This will give more certainty um, in many cases for some of these orders so that the um, foster parents can get on with it. Have you done any more cost, any cost things on the, ex, the cost of extra, the extra vetting requirements to the employers involved? Uh, we have had a bit of a look at it, and the cost was around one hundred and fifty thousand, two hundred thousand dollars for us to do government agencies, I believe. Um, and police are saying that each for most of them they do it anyway, um, so they can't see huge costs. Or they, although of course they're looking at the. You know, $5 charges that they might do, but we didn't, when we looked at it, it didn't seem excessive at all. Schools? Uh, well, schools should be doing it now. Are there any There's no way that teachers? a teacher should be teaching in a class without going through some sort of um, police check. No, but I have to do reviews and all that, which I assume would come at an extra cost. Mm. Certainly they haven't indicated that they were worried about a certain high cost for it. Where will all the um, betting data be held? And can you guarantee its privacy? Yeah, um, most of it's coming from police, and then it's the employer themselves that are doing it. They may choose to use a um, screening agency, which are around, and of course they have their own protocols for privacy, and there's never been any concern there. But um, it, look, I think what we have is a lot happening in this area, but it's not consistent. And unfortunately we have had examples in the, in the not too distant past, where we saw particularly teachers working where they shouldn't be. Um, you know, person A certainly comes to mind because part of um, some of the legislation of the restrictions on workforce will mean that they equally can't change their name um, because we see people trying to change their name and hide. But we also have strong evidence that some organisations use of what does work, of how you can reference check, on how you can use um, sort of intel from police, if you like, and they may word something that says they want you to go and check into this more. And that's where us setting up the standardised screening and vetting, it'll be relatively straightforward, but will be, um, I think, more in depth than what I want to do. But will the data there. on all the 370,000 no. individuals, will they be held in one place? No, or? not at all. So just by employers as they are now and HR departments. All these changes have been tested against a bit of rights and your confidence in our breaches? Look, they certainly are. Um, no, these people that um, we've got human rights and we've got the Bill of Rights that are um, identifying issues around them. There's no two ways about that and we'll be playing that out in select committee as well. Uh, with most of this, uh, you can see two sides of it. And I, um, so no, I, I certainly wouldn't say there's none. I just do think that after advice from Crown Law and advice from the Attorney General, that they are all um, common sense and make sense and are in the best interests of the child. Minister, in a lot of these cases, it's when the mother uh, gets into a new relationship, uh, something goes wrong there, and often it's too late, um, something's happened to the baby. Is it your hope that this new le legislation will help to identify vulnerable situations? earlier? Yeah. So for a lot of the work we're doing outside of this legislation, it is very much around that. So when you look at children's teams, the work they're doing on the ground, when we've got our first cases before them, um, and they are very much getting in earlier, uh, particularly the ones getting a health related at the moment, so they've turned up to the neonatal unit, their babies are born slightly premature, and they're either very young, we've got siblings who've been at risk before, so that is us getting in earlier. But in cases like where, um, I don't even like calling them a boyfriend because it seems to give them the status that they don't deserve, um, where these guys seem to drift into these relationships and pick on vulnerable women and their children and then at times um, you know, seriously hurt or kill them, 
it's kind of awful when you look at the, you know, when I, I sort of start looking through those children that have died in the last five years, it is boyfriend, stepfather, um, you know, it's that non-blood male relative, you know, guy that's stepped in, as you say. The police, if there's a civil order against them, these new child harm prevention orders, the police will be able to advise the woman that he has one of these orders and actually remove him from the premises. And if he shouldn't be there, he could be jailed for up to three years. That's a big change. Have you had a look at those cases from the, far, the last five years and whether or not orders could have been in place for, for men involved in those cases? Um, look, I'm, I'm hesitant to put cases against this work because the work is kind of so broad and each and every one of them was different in many ways. But I have absolutely no doubt that it could have made a difference in some cases. And so just to clarify, you've had advice that you are possibly breaching the Bill of Rights? Or? Well, just that there are, um, certainly what I've seen is some from human rights perspectives. Um, and there are some concerns around them. So the example I would give you is the child harm prevention orders. And one of the things that was raised was that um, they haven't been convicted and we're then, or they have been and have done their sentence and then we're, almost, we're giving them another civil order on top of it. So they're almost being, some would say, penalised twice. Uh, so that has certainly been raised. Um, but, you know, we will work our way through these things through Select Committee and on the balance of all of the work that we have done, we have done I am extremely confident that we're falling on the side of these children. And in many cases, it's for once we're falling on the side of these kids and putting their human rights first. Um, but in <coughs> others, I'm quite happy to, to have an open debate and, and see where we end up. Do you know which parties support these changes? Um, I majority, yeah, I've written to all of them just yesterday outli outlining them. I've certainly had conversations with um, most other parties, so look, we'll work our way through it. So no, I don't at this stage, but um, I'm confident that we will have the numbers to pass it. Can you explain the provisions around um, foreigners who might have been charged overseas for child abuse? Are they tracked when they come back? Well, it depends on their immigration status. So obviously anyone um, coming into the country and trying to get permanent residency or anything like that has all checks put on them through the system, um, with previous convictions and things like that, but it would depend on if they were trying to work with children. So I couldn't say, we don't, obviously don't do it broadly, but if they're trying to go into the children's workforce then they would fall under this. What about Kiwis who have gone overseas and been found guilty of child abuse and have come back to New Zealand? Yeah, education are doing some more work on that. They've actually been um, heavily involved in the screening and vetting um, work that's gone on here, and they are doing some further work alongside police on how we can um, get better advice on overseas convictions and how they might be considered as part of this work. And will police be able to tell partners that, you know, or, or you know, women that the guy that they're now with has been done? They will if there's an order against them. Um, but on other sides, I think it's, um, it's, it, it's sort of at the discretion and I'd have to take it out of the Minister of Police. Just in the Jay Bayless case, the police weren't allowed to tell her or her mum that um, the partner was abusive. Mm. Yeah, so I can't give you details around that. Those 650 assessments, will they begin, are they ongoing now, sort of ahead of you know, the law being enacted so that you can move them straight away, or will they begin? No, they're more, they will begin as such when the law is enacted. We do do a number of assessments now. So as I said, we're removing 160 um, children in that first 30 days. I'm not sure what the number is of how many more we do that we don't end up um, removing in that first 30 days, but it's a lot. Um, we also run family group conferences where we try and look at other ways of working. So we are already doing assessments and making judgments. I think the key difference for that is a, it's only those that we want to remove that go to court, whereas I'm saying all of them go to court. I want that extra oversight. I want to actually improve the quality of assessments, to be quite frank, and that is quite a way to do that. So, um, so that, is, that is sort of the dual, um, I think, benefit that we'll get for it. So I, you will see, I think, a few more assessments, but it won't be overall until it all comes into play. Just on the, the vetting, you mentioned James Parker earlier, that would have stopped him in his tracks, it never would have happened. Well, I can't say that for sure. You know, crystal ball and all of that sort of thing. But from what I have seen of the case, a whole lot of people held information. There were concerns overseas, there were concerns in New Zealand. If, they, if he had been reference checked correctly, 
um, a factor they'd collected the information that agencies had, put it all in one place, and then followed what will be that standard um, uh, recruiting tool, then they, I'm sure, would have seen a series of serious concerns and not have made those decisions. And I think that goes across agencies. You know, from what I've seen, a whole lot of agencies held information on him. Certainly some of the community had concerns. If you put that whole picture together, I don't think he would have been working in that environment.